I, uh, a couple weeks ago, as you know, I wasn't here, and I was in San Diego on a four-day retreat where originally I had very little to do except lead some English, chanting in English in the morning and evening, and ended up teaching kids, I had about 85 kids that I worked with every day in the morning and the afternoon. And while I was talking to them, I said, um, well, you know a monk that you feel that's enlightened, don't you? Not one of them responded. So I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, because Sandy's under a great delusion about me, but I leave it alone. And um, there's, there, there really is a problem that's been developing for hundreds of years in Buddhism, and it's called, I'm not good enough, or maybe next time around, or if I can do this with the power of somebody else helping me, then maybe I can possibly struggle through and actually understand reality. And all of these things are happening. And I mentioned it before, there is apparently a movement afoot. I believe it started in Taiwan, but it spread through Vietnam, where they're uh, putting forth the idea that all you have to do is just simply say the name of the Buddha. Now this is not to be confused with Pure Land Buddhism. Because part of the practice within Pure Land Buddhism is to, whether it's Jodo Shin or it's Chinese version or the Vietnamese version, is to recite the name of the Buddha or the Buddhas and uh, some visualization work and some other things. But within those schools, Nobody has forgotten that there were actually precepts to you, and that your behavior has something to do with karma and that uh, you determine things for yourself. And so this latest school has come out with the idea that all you have to do is just say the name of the Buddha. And um, of course that's absolutely silly. You can be the meanest, nastiest, terriblest person in the whole world. But as long as you say in the Mahayirabhan, everything's fine. Okay? And every time you do that, you wipe out all karma, and uh, then you can go kill some more people, and uh, murder some people, and rob some people. And uh, that's the way, of course, that I look at it, which makes it absurd. So I said to these kids, and when I say kids, I think the youngest was 11 up through 17 or 18. And I said, so you have some monks that you think are enlightened, right? No reaction. Which means that we have some strange ideas about what an enlightened person is. And uh, it's, it's, it's an honest uh, delusion because over the years, people have talked about uh, Buddhas being able to do a whole variety of things, fly through the air, be in multiple places simultaneously, read people's mind, know the past, know the future. Uh, it just goes on and on. Cure. There are some uh, sects within Buddhism that uh, have picked up what I call the Christianity illness. The Buddha can come out and place a hand on you and all things will be cured don't understand why that would have anything to do with enlightenment, but it's, it all goes along with this notion of miracles. And it is so strong that the Tibetans, I call them the Johnny-come-latelys in the Buddhist world, because they were the last country to become Buddhist, they've even decided that the leader of their religious faith and country is a reincarnation of a mythological bodhisattva, which makes things really bizarre. And what I don't understand is why we have to have all of that. Sandy, have you ever met a bodhisattva? Of course you have. Anybody here not met a bodhisattva? Even Eric has met a bodhisattva. 
Anybody here ever met somebody they thought might be awakened? Yeah. Mary's shaking her head. Mary's, Mary's got a lot of experience there, so she might have even bumped into a couple of groups. No? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, okay. Well, we don't have to be embarrassed about it. I mean, it's, it's somewhat of a goal, although we talk about not getting attached to the goal. But we have this practice. Uh, my first teacher, uh, once in a while, he didn't talk very much, but once in a while when he did give a talk, he would talk about the different forms of Zen. And you know the Japanese, they can't leave anything alone. They've just got to just keep elaborating on it. So we had, you know, we had the everyday Zen, and we had the Zen waiting to be enlightened Zen. And we had the Zen from reading books, and we had the Zen from discussion. And of course, all the time he was talking about this, he was making fun of it. Because to him, there was really only one Zen. And that was the Zen of doing Zazen, the Zen of doing meditation. And everything else was just kind of a waste of time. And I was infected by his way of looking at things, because for years when people would come to the temple that I was at, and they would say, as they invariably do, what should I read? I would always give the same answer. And I gave that to Puja years ago. I said, you don't need to read anything. You're here. Because I had been taught that the practices and was doing Zazen. Which sounds a little simplistic. It's like saying the practice of physical uh, health is doing setups. And I realized that that's the way it comes across. Of course, there's a couple other things if we want to stay physically healthy. We need to eat healthy. And we don't, we have to be careful about not overeating and kind of having a balance in what we eat, right? And we need some other, it's, I, I always laugh at these people with these abs, you know, because there's absolutely nothing natural about them. There is no activity that I know of anybody can do naturally they end up with a stomach that looks like that. But boy, everybody wants to have one, right? So they do all of these extreme setup things. Brian knows what I'm talking about. All these extreme setup things, trying to have this washboard thing in here, which is in no way natural. But my first teacher felt that uh, when he said Zazen, he was using Zazen the way Dogen Zenji used Zazen. And Dogen Zenji said that Zazen should be for me everything we do in, in our life. So that when he started, the first thing he wrote in his uh, Shobo Genzo, which got included in the Shobo Genzo, he wrote three instructions on how to do meditation. Pretty straightforward stuff. One of them got included in the Shobo Genzo. The second thing he wrote was the instruction to the cook. Okay, so here's a guy, uh, passed away in 1253, that was a while ago, and he felt that the second most important thing was to tell the cook how to conduct himself. The first most important thing was to teach everybody how to do meditation. So what's the deal with the cook? Well, he felt, as I do, that the cook was the second most important person in the temple, in the monastery, because they had the responsibility of maintaining the health of the people there. And that uh, we know, or I know from personal experience and, and experience of my friends, that very often in monasteries in Japan, there's malnutrition because all they're eating is rice. And contrary to one opinion, you cannot exist on just on rice. A little vitamin here and there probably helps. I know that there's this group of people that think if you eat brown rice and that's all you ever eat, then you will just be incredibly healthy. And um, but apparently not. Apparently you can go into some real illness. So Dogen felt that the, this one, this mindfulness about keeping people healthy in the monastery, was very very important. And for monks. And this is the way I used to look at it. I still kind of look at it that way, particularly when I get around the Vietnamese monks. 
Okay. Um, there is a perception that all of this stuff has been given up. And actually it has. There are all kinds of things that are given up to be a full-time monk. Earlier I started to wax poetic on one of my favorite topics, part-time monks. But full-time monk, most of the things that people take great delight in, they don't get to experience that. Uh, because they just they, they have too many things they have to do and, or, and or they've given it up as a precept. You know, they're not out doing shots. Is that what it's called, Brian? Doing shots? I don't understand how anybody does that. I've seen it in the movies. You know, usually it's women. Let's go do shots. And they've got 16 shot glasses in front of them. They're still standing. Three and I'm on the floor. That's from when I was a kid and I used to drink. Yeah. So two, and I'm a really happy guy. <laughs> Gonna get the guitar out and start singing. So I don't understand these people that just see me drink and drink and drink. But a lot of those things are given up. Uh, very much having a personal, private life, as most people think of it, is given up. Now I met a monk this last weekend when I was in Orange County, and uh, he invited me to his temple uh, for today. And, and I didn't even say anything to Tai Bui Mung about it because he's held down the fort for two weeks in a row and, and of course Tree who regaled you. Uh, but he wanted me to come to his temple. And he says, well I'll send you a ticket. His temple is in San Jose. And he wanted me to come up there for Mulan, which of course we celebrated very early and I'm going to see if I can just that little bit. But I, I had to call him the next day. I said, well, let me talk. And I didn't talk to him. I just said, no, this is absurd. I'm barely here this month. So I, uh, I just simply called. And after talking to three people, got somebody that could understand me and said, please tell the master that I cannot be there. Um, so he's traveling. He came in that morning for a, a Mulan ceremony in Orange County and then was returning that evening to his temple. And uh, and I hear about monks, well they go to Vietnam and they have a temple over there and they're going here and there. But it's all in the guise of Buddhism. So it's probably okay. Not that they're not having fun, they are. but. There's this idea of, of sacrifice. There is no sacrifice within Buddhism. Is there right? Have you ever seen anybody sacrificing any, anything? Giving up something so that they gnash? Oh, Mary says yes. Uh, Mary says she saw sacrifice. They just didn't understand it. That was all. It felt like a sacrifice at the time. But eventually they came to understand that it wasn't the same. But I used to, when I went to the federal prison, every once in a while I'd have somebody to come in there and say, you make a good monk. Oh, no, no, I can't give up everything. No, no, no. So this idea of awakening, well, awakening is just seeing things as they are. That's all it is. There's no magical powers that come with it. It's just seeing things as they are. There is a myth within Buddhism that when you awaken, you are now the master of heaven and earth and you can control all things. That's nice, isn't it? Wouldn't that be nice if that's the way it really was? That the, the moment of awakening you could elevate. Remember the guy that went through America, Rajneese? Remember him? All of his advanced students could levitate. And I remember someone telling me he was on a train and then in the next compartment there were a bunch of Rajni's students. And I said, well, what was that like? And he said, noisy. Because they kept they kept jumping up in the air trying to stay there. And then they would come down with a boom. And then there was a whole bunch of them going up and down like that. Knowing the past through the future. I, I, re I really don't know what the use of that is. Does it have a practical purpose? Does it help you cook rice? 
I don't think so. Uh, matter of fact, most of the powers that the Buddha would, is attributed to the Buddha uh, for two reasons. One, because he was awakened, and the other, because he had gone through cabillions of births. You know, somebody figured out how many how many thousands of births that he went through. And, and yet the Buddha never worried about that a great deal. He did tell stories. He said, back when I was, and then he would tell a story. And um, of course, that's the way we teach within Buddhism, is with stories. We really teach that way in Zen. So he would talk about the monk when he was a monk, and the mother uh, tiger was starving to death and she couldn't feed her cubs, one of the most famous of the Chautauqua tales, um, that as a monk he sent his attendant away and took off his robe and fed himself to the mother tiger so she could feed the babies. Kind of gruesome. But there was a real point to that story. And uh, Mulan, I've been selling Mulan incorrectly for going on 40 years. I always talk about it as the great memorial that we hold every year, Oba. The great memorial. I've been wrong. Okay, I've been completely wrong, and I realize that because I've been invited to any number of uh, Mulan ceremonies, and the Vietnamese no longer are calling it Mulan. They're calling it Parents' Day. And that's really what Mulan is. That's the story that I tell. Uh, in two weeks, I will go to Gardena and I will explain to the kids that Mulan started because a monk had a nightmare about his mother suffering in hell. It's all centered on the parents, the sacrifice of the parents. Now, now, Mary, we can talk about sacrifice, the sacrifice of parents. Except, don't be confused. There's never been a parent that ever sacrificed anything. They did it out of love. That's not a sacrifice. Did they give stuff up? Absolutely. Why did they give it up? They gave it up for their children. And that in itself is a return. So there is nothing lost. The balance is always there. So Dogen said to the cook, said, you have a, a great responsibility to take care of the physical health. So I had a book that I put together years ago that somebody told me was floating around. Somebody has it. Maybe Suko had it. You won't see it again, maybe. Uh, and I, I went over the different jobs in the temple, and I said the responsibility of the abbot was the spiritual well-being of the people in the temple. And this, the responsibility of the Tenzo or the cook was the physical well-being. And I put them one, too. That's the way I enumerated it. And I simply did that to try to give my American students at the time a bit of a grasp for what's going on there. Because the assistant abbot, which was Puja, he defined what that meant. He said, my job is to take care of the physical buildings. So that's what my job is, is to maintain the buildings. I came out one day and he's putting a new roof on the Zendo. Never said a word to me. He's up there bang, 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 putting a roof on the Zendo. I said, what are you doing? He says, well, it started to leak. And so I ordered this stuff, and here I should jump in and do that kind of stuff. But no sacrifice involved in that. Enlightenment is not about sacrifice. Enlightenment is about discovery. It's about finding something. And the Korean, I told Sun when she was here, she's not going to be here today, because by this time she would have snuck in the door. I told Sun, I said, you know, in Korea, in the meditation hall, over the altar, they don't have a Buddha. They have a mirror. So when you go to bow at the altar as you're leaving the meditation hall, you bow to the Buddha, the being. And so the discovery is who you are. You just kind of never figured it out. I, I personally have a belief that all babies know who they are. But at some point they get barraged by people telling them Mom and Dad tell them who they should be. They go to school at the ripe old age of five, and they, the people start telling them who they should be. By the time they go to college, 
they're so confused they really have no idea who they are. And then when they get into college, they go through this great intellectual explosion where they question everything and they, you know, they come up with all kinds of, as Rush Limbaugh would say, liberal ideas that destroy them for all eternity. And, and then start finding themselves. And they do to some degree. They start having a bit of an opinion of their own. But they don't really discover who they are. The function of Zazen is to discover who you are. The function of cleaning rice. You know, I don't know about you, but I always wash the rice before I cook it. And that's because little pebbles. It's a hole over. I think most of the rice now, all the pebbles are out of it. But it's still a hole over from that time. Now they put talcum on it so it won't stick. So I was told to wash the rice because of the talcum. But before there was talcum, there were little stones. Dogen talks about picking the stones out, but not throwing away a grain of rice, being completely mindful of what you're doing. So at some point, the monk awakens, or the layperson awakens. And we read about the sixth patriarch, who as a layperson woke up and went off with the robe and the bowl of the fifth patriarch and ended up living for, I think, seven years or six in the forest with woodcutters, eating vegetable and, and beef stew. And he would pick the meat out and give it to the, give it to the woodcutters so that he was eating vegetarian. Okay. And after all of those years, he was settled down enough that he could go back in and he went to hear a, a master talking. And we already know that he was awake. If we had any doubt with his encounter with the fifth patriarch, when he walked into the courtyard to hear this great master giving a talk, there were two months ar monks arguing. And they were standing by a flagpole. It was a Buddhist uh, custom at the time. Remember we had a little flagpole for about a year? And it got filled with water and somebody said to me, it's all full of water and it's going to rust and never going to get it down. So I took it down. But we had a flagpole and we put a, the Buddhist flag up on it every Sunday. And that was uh, harking back to a tradition from the Buddhist time where a flag was put up whenever the Buddha was going to give a talk. So after lunch they brought the flag up the pole. And so this master was giving a talk on a sutra and they had a flagpole and they had a flag up the pole. And the two monks were arguing. One monk was saying, I think the flag's moving. And the other monk said, no, 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 the wind's moving. No, 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 the flag's moving. No, 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 the wind's moving. And the sixth patriarch walked by, not a monk, and says, neither. The mind is moving. And so we know as he entered the temple to hear the lecture that he was already awakened. And the master giving the, giving the lecture at the temple said, I don't know who you are, but I know that you're awakened. And he ordained him on the spot. And he ordained him so that he could teach, because we have a tradition that lay people don't normally teach. Part of the responsibility of monks. And of course, you know that when I say monks, I always mean men and women. But monks are the ones that teach. That's their job. That's why we make the big money. Yeah, so the sixth patriarch gave the example. And so we, we see this phenomenon that sometimes people miss that, and my Zumi Roshi, it's, this is my second quote. <laughs> I always have one that I talk about his idea of enlightenment. It's like the sky. It just keeps going on and going on and going on. That's my, that's like my fame. Favorite Buddha quote is that enlightenment goes on like the sky. One time he told his students, because they're they're very determined to become awakened. You know, if you know anybody think about the people at ZCLA, oh they do hundreds, hundreds of koans with the whole purpose of becoming awakened, becoming living Buddhas. How many koans do they do? Tai Bui How many? 250? 275? I can't remember. It's a lot, right? It's a lot of coins. 
107? 187. 187. That's a lot. And he told them one day, he says, enlightenment's to begin with. And I, honest to goodness, don't think that most of them even got what he said. They probably thought, well, that's when I get to wear a brown robe. In Japanese tradition, you're, you're, until you're a high monk, you saw once in a while they'd wear brown robes. Remember the old guys? Remember? Guys who looked as old as you? Yeah? And they'd have the brown case and the brown robe and all that. And that, technically, any fully ordained Soto priest. Did you go to Soto or Rinzai? Soto. Soto. Technically, any fully ordained Soto priest could wear a brown robe like we wear. But this is our everyday color. This doesn't mean anything special about us. You'll notice my robe is exactly the same color as their robe. That tree is trying to outdo me because he's wearing one that looks like it's faded, which means that he's been wearing it a long ah! time. <laughs> so, this idea that, uh, I think a lot of people thought that when he said it's the beginning, they thought, oh, well now I get to wear fancy hats and I get to wear fancy robes. And I get to carry, they carry that funny little crooked stick, which is an imitation of the spine. Okay? It's a little miniature staff that they carry. That's not what he meant. What he meant was, that's the beginning. That's where the work starts. And what's the work? Okay, you have an insight. Now what are you going to do with it? You still have bad habits. I know I have lots of bad habits, don't I, Sam? Uh, I'm not going there. <laughs> I have lots of bad habits. And so now, with this insight, we start working on these bad habits, trying trying to correct the things that we're not 100% happy with. Okay, I've cut down my popsicle intake. I'm, I'm reporting to you. I've been really working on myself on this one. I've given up chocolate. <laughs> There's no point to life anymore. No chocolate, almost no popsicles. What am I going to do? Um, but that, that is what the work is. That's what begins. It's integrating this insight into our everyday life and how we live our life. Okay? I can see that all people are the same. Then why don't I treat people the same? Now, I don't mean the same same. That's one of the, I, I just I, I just got done reading when I was in San Diego on our breaks, which <laughs> I'm telling you, these monks put on a retreat to make us look like pikers. But on our, on our break, uh, between things, I was reading this book on New Buddhism. And this guy starts talking about everybody thinks that everybody's the same and that's the problem. No, wait a minute. No, he thinks that everybody's different. I can't remember. It was total nonsense. We wouldn't have any wars if people understood that everybody was the same. We're not the same. I smell a lot better than Brian smells. Kurt's a lot wiser than I am. Mary and Sandy are a lot prettier than me. Boy, Mung, he can work a lot harder than me. I've seen him work. A tree. A tree was chanting the day and being he has told me that he can't do that. I snuck up on him today, and he was just chanting his heart out, much better than I could ever do it. So we're not all the same, but we all had the same mother. Scientifically, we know that, that our DNA all goes back to one beginning. So far, I remember science. I had a professor in my first year in college that said the difference between religion and science science can be proved wrong. Religion can never be proved wrong. So they may discover another line, but right now everybody goes back to a common mother. And the Jews 4,000 years ago borrowed a myth and gave her a name. And her name was I can't remember. No, it wasn't Eve. What, what was Adam's first wife? Oh, Lilith. Lilith. It was Lilith. 
so you can tell what a good Christian I'm not. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a little thing. So, the, the notion of enlightenment is just simply you have an experience. But the people that we think of as enlightened beings are people that have integrated that into their life. So that if I'm prejudiced, if I'm born in the South, and I'm prejudiced, and I become awakened, do you think I stop becoming, stop being prejudiced? Is that what you really think happens? Just like that? You don't think the Buddha had to work on that? Because he, he was born into a system that was much more prejudiced than the American South will ever be. They had stages of prejudice. I think he really had to work on that, seeing that all people underneath their skin had the same mother. I don't want to, I want to stop ever saying they're the same, because you're not the same. It's, but it's like telling, I have a friend who grew up in a family of eight children. Obviously they were not the same, but they had the same mother. So these kinds of things we can understand through awakening. So I looked at these kids and I went, oh, I'm really very sorry for you. And I've met enlightened monks. Matter of fact, there are a couple here. Keep your eyes open. You'll see Buddhas walking around in yellow robes. So don't get confused. Enlightenment isn't any big deal. It's just knowing who you are. Not knowing who you are is a big deal. So let's work on just washing the rice, cooking the meals, and being in the moment. I'll ring a bell for our video.